Hi, this is Dr. Shannon Wong Lerner, host of The Intersection, where diverse folks converse. Created by and for queer people of color and gender non-conforming people, The Intersection is curated side by side with some of the most brilliant and fascinating minds in our community. I create these programs keeping in mind all of the things that aren't said and all of the things that we aren't able to talk about within heterosexual and cisgendered produced shows. In the intersection, you'll find firsthand what the leading voices of our community are thinking, the work they're producing, the concerns they have, and what they hope for us and what they leave behind in their legacy. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi, you are here with Dr. Shannon Wong Lerner and the intersection Diverse Folks Converse, programming made by and for queer people of color and gender nonconforming people. We are here in season two, which is very, I still think it's really exciting that that is even happening. Episode four. And the title of our episode for this month is Be You and Unapologetically Out Loud. Gender Cool helps transgender and non-binary youth tell their own stories. I'm very pleased today to have with us the founder of Gender Cool, Gara Goldstein, who's also a diversity, equity, and inclusion expert, wife, parent, and proud transgender person. Hi, Gara. So happy to have you here. Thank you, Dr. Lerner. How are you? I'm doing really well. It's a really beautiful day here in uh, Sacramento. It's sunny. It's actually really foggy this morning, but it's really pretty out. Uh, So typically how I start the episode is I just talk a little bit about how we came to this theme, you know, how I came to learn about you and just kind of kick things off and then just start our conversation. Does that sound good to you? Yeah. Great. Yeah. So, um, so I actually spoke with uh, John Grosshandler originally, who is also, what is his official title for Gender Cool? Is it also f- co-founder or? Yeah, so there's three co-founders. Oh, okay. There's John, uh, who you spoke to, his wife, Jennifer, and I um, are the Wonderful. three co-founders of Gender Cool. Great. So I actually spoke with him originally. And then when I told him what the theme, overall theme of the podcast was, he was like, yeah, you could talk to me, but I am like a cis white man. (laughs) And so he just thought it was a better fit for us to speak. And then after speaking with you, I was so happy that, you know, it all came together. And we came up with this title just because a lot of what the intersection is about is giving voice to the most underrepresented communities in LGBTQIA+. And I feel like trans and non-binary and gender non-conforming kids and teens are perhaps one of the most underrepresented and misrepresented or just excluded in the media. And that's, I, you know, as I read over your website and spoke to you, it's like definitely a theme for Gender Cool is trying to correct that. And so this idea that you're providing this platform in like multiple ways, you know, you have books out there to help uh, trans non-binary and gender non-conforming youth and you give them this platform. I I was looking at all your social media. So you have photos of them, of accomplishments they're doing and profiles. It's just so wonderful uh, for me to see, especially someone who grew up, you know, not seeing that. Really, I I tell people all the time, the LGBT center, the B and T were just like hanging off the sign. (laughs) You know, we were just not really part of what was happening. So um, it's just so wonderful that, that you all are doing this. Thank you. So I was thinking that we could just jump right in. Uh, you know, <laughs> sounds like I redundant, but gender cool is such a cool name. You know, whenever I tell people that name, they are like, they don't even know what it's about yet, but their ears are perked up. And so I would really love, maybe we can just start out just to introduce gender cool is what is the main mission of gender cool? And could you give us maybe like a quick synopsis of one of your most recent projects? Sure. So um, Gender Cool started out really as a storytelling campaign and it's turned into really a worldwide movement. And our goal, what we are all about is helping replace opinions 
whatever they may be, surrounding transgender and non-binary people and replace those opinions with the actual experience of meeting someone who is transgender and non-binary. And that's really the core of our work. Um, but we do that work specifically uh, under what we consider four pillars of our work. We have uh, an education pillar. Mm -hmm. So that's just helping educate people around terminology. What does transgender and non-binary mean to those who, who define that way? Um, just really um, reaching out to people and meeting them where they are to have this conversation in a non-threatening way. Then we um, support um, in the areas of advocacy. So we are very active um, working with political leaders, um, with school boards, with coaches, um, you know, athletic teams, helping people um, figure out the best policy and procedures to, you know, share equity in, in all of these spaces. And then um, another one of our pillars is leader leadership development. So working with our champions, we call them, our young people who uh, identify as transgender and non-binary. And we help them with um, paid reverse mentorships, uh, paid um, internships, and really help um, them develop their storytelling skills um, and how they can engage and share their life experiences with other people. And then I guess the fourth pillar truly is what you're talking about is visibility, mm -hmm. um, being out there, being unapologetically proud mm -hmm. of who we are as transgender and non-binary people and um, is setting really the foundation for young people to share their positive experiences about who they are as opposed to, you know, many um many people leading uh, with the trauma-based story, mm -hmm. which um, which is important, but um, it's also important to balance that with the positive aspects and triumphs of uh, young transgender and non-binary kids. I really love that. Um, and I do want, I do have that as part of what I want to talk about today is what you, exactly what you just said. It's, you know, something we've talked about on the show. And I think going the direction of talking about uh, trans and non-binary kids and teens, uh, and why it's so important to be mindful of those trauma narratives that I remember as we talked about it, uh, many of these youth are inheriting it, right? It's like, this isn't even my narrative. So why do I have to deal with your narrative in this multi-generational way? And I would, you know, I, I, I'm really looking forward to talking about that more. As you're talking about like all these tiers of you know, the structure that you're setting up for uh, for trans and non-binary youth, it makes me think of, you know, growing up and being stuck in the school system and wishing that that was there, right? In hindsight or finding, you know, the LGBT center and feeling like, because I was I came out as bisexual at the time, uh, realizing like, I don't actually feel like I belong here. I actually used to go and do talks at high schools uh, for a while and I remember feeling like I was half queer, you know, or <laughs> was like half legitimate because, right. or not at all, right? And right. so um, I can only imagine how how trans and non-binary youth feel in those spaces where they don't feel legitimate, right? And it, it seems like you're covering the gamut of how to kind of create this nest or this nurturing space, uh, which I think is really beautiful. Uh, I would love to, you know, hear more about perhaps aspects of transness or trans or, or non-binary kids in the media or youth in the media and kind of the problems that you see and, and how you're trying to correct those. Yeah, you know, I don't know that there was a wrong way. You know, I see that the conversations for marginalized communities are somewhat parallel. You know, we all, or I should say most marginalized communities start out seeking empathy, right? And um, that's a really good route. And in order to seek empathy, you have to share your trauma. I mean, that's how you do it. And so 
um, for for many years, and, and to go back on what you were saying earlier, is that there have been so many amazing LGBTQ leaders mm -hmm. before doing the work that Gender Cool is doing now. We are stepping in and evolving this space from those that carried this burden very early on. And I think it is important to point out that even for me as a transgender person um, and the Gross Handler family who helped start Gender Cool, we are bringing to the table very different life experiences. They are the parents of a transgender mm -hmm. child and I am a transgender adult with two children and a wife. And Wonderful. so we bring a very wide gamut to the life experience of living in this gender identity space. Um, but ultimately, I think it's important to listen to what our elders were telling us, right? That they were sharing their trauma so that we wouldn't have to. And mm. Gender Cool believes that we are at the time where there are many thousands of children who are benefiting from the work of those that came before, where they are living in affirming homes, in affirming communities, in affirming schools, and not really having any of these traumatic experiences that many of us still have. You sure. don't want to say or we, we not, replay them, right? That's right. But these kids um, that aren't living in that space are the beneficiaries of all of the work that we've done. Mm -hmm. And to us, it's a beautiful thing, right? It's like homage to all of the work that's been done to just let these kids be kids. Yes. Right? Just let them live their lives the way we have always envisioned. And so that really is the deep work of Gender Cool is to carry the work that's been done before and allow these kids to live in a space where they do not have to lead with a trauma-based life experience in order to share about who they are. And mm -hmm. that's, um, you know, I think a really core critical aspect of gender cool. I think that's beautiful. I mean, one thing that I've said to multiple people, to you included, uh, in terms of gender cool's focus on not only trans and non-binary youth, but the support system, right? I always have that model too, like in my work. And when I used to teach, it was never about this kind of rugged individualist. You have to like, you know, um, toil through something was like, what kind of support do you have? What's going on with you? And then like building those bridges, uh, this idea of family, you know, and the importance of family and support and community uh, and and trans and non-binary youth is really, it's like happening everywhere, right? And to me, it's, so my story is that I, I was out when I was 15 to 18, then I went back in the closet for over 20 years and then just came out about a year and six, five months ago or so. So it's almost like I'm an old queer person and a new queer person, you know, and there have been so many changes in culturally and socially for me. I remember thinking, you know, being so excited. There was a, a pride, a pride uh, celebration in the Lavender District here in Sacramento or so excited the LGBT center existed. And then for me, always being affiliated to bars and like party life. And I'm sober too, and was sober then. And so I always felt uncomfortable in those spaces as a youth. And then also as someone who recently came out, even though I'm quite older now, I still feel kind of adolescent and I want to be careful and tender with myself as I go through this journey. So I guess what I'm trying to say is um, I, I'm really curious about that shift, you know, because, and maybe I'm saying this in a very naive way because I'm thinking of, you know, the nineties essentially when, you know, there were like, and there, and this still exists, right. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, there is a, I think with adult queer people, and when we think of those pride celebrations and social things, there is a hypersexualization that can happen, right? Because uh, in many spaces, we're kind of repressed. So someone had to explain that to me. I was like, why are these things happening to me? And I didn't expect for, and then someone explained that to me. I'm like, okay, that makes sense. But what about trans and non-binary youth, right? How can we create uh, examples for them that feel comfortable to them so they don't feel pressured by this old way, right? Which to me, when I look back, you know, 
I remember going to one of those celebrations and these older women like trying to like pressure me to do like a wet t-shirt contest. And I was like, mm -hmm. I'm just here to interview this band, you know? Yeah. And I felt so uncomfortable. I think it was like 16, 17, you know? How can we, um, I'm really curious about that because this is something that I don't think people understand when we bring up trans and non-binary youth and like the work you're doing, the work that, you know, Joe Barb is doing with the LGBTQ Family Connection Center or Steve Peterson with Bursting Through. He's talking about these straight queer uh, coalitions to essentially help people who are misinformed, but also to help youth too and families. Uh, it's such a different world. And to me, it's very exciting to see this, uh, the all the possibilities, like you're saying, like hopefully these youth won't have to go through the same traumas that some of us went through because those structures weren't there. Right. I, I, I'm sorry I'm not asking you an exact question, but I just would love to hear your perspective on this because I think people, when they hear trans and non-binary binary youth, they don't understand that the structure that like you're providing, that Joe, that Steve are providing, they don't understand that that's there. They just see these misrepresentations. And they also, I don't think they see them as, as kids in a way, if that makes sense. Like they don't see them in that way and they need to. Yeah, I think, you know, I understand exactly what you're saying, um, even though it's not in the form of a question. Uh, <laughs> the LGBTQ plus acronym, I think is important when we start talking about community and what makes up our community. Mm -hmm. And we have to be very focused and hyper-specific when we're involving young people. It's important to differentiate that LGB yes. is about sexual orientation, right? It's about who you are attracted to. It is about mature aspects of your being when you are sexually or physically attracted to someone, which is completely independent from your gender identity, who you know yourself to be. And in these spaces around trans youth and non-binary children, parents, families, caregivers, neighbors, teachers are seeing children at a very young age, three, four, five years old, asserting who they are in regards to their gender identity. And when you're looking at a five, six, seven-year-old child, it has absolutely zero to do with who they are attracted to. Yes. It has zero to do with sexual orientation in any way, shape, or form. And so you're right. Even though we're part of the same community, we're not talking about the same topics. What we all share as part of a community is the marginalization of who we are. Yes. All right. Or Sometimes we talk about sharing the closet, right? Not coming out and that coming out experience, disclosing who we are authentically to those we love the most is an experience we share in the community. But in aspect of gender identity versus sexual orientation, there is a huge difference. And yes, there are so many parents of trans and non-binary kids that understand that maybe a pride parade is not an appropriate place for a child. Sure. Because that parade, even though it includes transgender people, it is first and foremost, right, a protest right, mm. against the marginalization of preventing people from loving who they love. Yes. Right. And so we get caught up in so many aspects of our lives regarding holidays and meanings and we get swept in and forget origin right we yes. forget why things exist in the first place but um yeah i could see how like you sharing that story about being uncomfortable um because you are still developing your sexual orientation, your sexual identity. Sure. And, and I still am, even though yeah. now I'm quite older. It's, um, you know, I'm sorry, cut you off. No, that's fine. But just the aspect of, um, you know, what I think you're asking about is 
how do parents navigate this space? And then that's how we do. We really clearly talk about how for most people, you get a clear sense of who you are at a very young age. And we simply stand in our own experiences and ask people to explore when they knew who they were. Yes. Um, if that's even a possible question to answer, really. Yeah, I think that's really, I love, and I know we spoke about that before, but I love that you spelled it out for us like that, because I do think we forget. It's something that is so basic, but even those of us in the LGBTQI community, right, we forget that difference between sexual identity, gender identity. And when we think about youth, it's particularly important to make that distinction so that the youth don't feel pressured or exploited or objectified or like that that, that could happen, right? Uh, and to make sure these spaces are open in a safe way uh, makes me think right now, you know, everyone's saying that 2021 has been the the worst for uh, um, anti-LGBTQ measures, and many of them have been anti-trans, uh, anti, you know, GNC measures uh, in the process of becoming law. So like, you know, making it a felony to provide transgender youth life-saving health care to banning transgender girls from playing in sports. So uh, I actually looked it up. It was 250 anti-LGBTQ bills were intro introduced in leg legislature. And I knew a law, I knew a big number of them were going to be anti-transgender. 119, right? So almost half. Yeah. Um, just a few shy are anti-trans. So I guess my question is, um, you know, I'd had Dr. Daniel Coleman on the very first episode and they were talking about uh, black queer trans relationships. But they also were talking about trans bodies and they were talking about the ways in which sometimes people will get a little bit of information and they think they get kind of arrogant <laughs> and think they can sort of like tell trans people what they can and can't do with their bodies, right? Um, the thing happening right now in the Supreme Court with Mississippi is uh, is and abortion rights is a is a a prime example of that because trans and gender nonconforming people are part of that as well, and the most marginalized people having access to have autonomy of their bodies, right? For me, I and the question I want to ask you is. Why is it so difficult? Because everything you just said makes so much sense about young people, even at the age of three, five, knowing who they are, right? Their origin, like you said. Why is it so difficult for people, whether they're in our community, in LGBT community or not, to give the autonomy to youth that they do know who they are, they should be able to do what they want with their bodies so they can be that person and that, you know, that they know their truth and that, that we should listen to them. Right. I, I would really love to hear that, that answer from you. Um, yeah. Well, we could write several novels about it. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, I think it, it comes from, you know, the, it comes from the misogynistic aspect of, how this culture is designed and works, right? We we take autonomy away from those um, that we believe um, aren't smart enough, right? Or mm -hmm. whatever. I mean, it's the same thing, regardless of what marginalized community you look at. And, you know, taking away someone's autonomy is, it's a power grab. That's what this whole thing is about when we talk about trans legislation. And I think it's important to point out that not only is it you know, transgender specific, but it's trans youth, right? Yes. So these policies guised as protection of trans youth are actually the opposite. It is bullying straight up period, end of story. It is adults bullying children. And how that is even permissible to me is um, really sad. Right. Mm -hmm. It's that same thing where we're just not focusing on the realities of what is taking place here. You're about midway through the intersection. Diverse Folks Converse podcast. I wanted to take a moment 
to let you know why I created the intersection, it was because I didn't see a lot of representation of the most brilliant and creative minds in our communities. All I saw were misrepresentations in popular culture and the media. So I wanted to provide a free and accessible outlet for us all to enrich our lives and to provide meaning for the things that we experience every single day. None of us get paid for the intersection and this is not a income generating endeavor for any of us. We do this because we want to add to our culture and we want to add to your lives. So we just ask that you participate as well and contribute to us through subscribing to our channel and and leaving reviews and telling your friends and telling the community put it up on web boards sh- share it in social media tell people about us but really subscribing adding the reviews to Dr. Shannon Wong Learner's YouTube channel which houses the intersection to the intersection on Apple Podcasts or Spotify is really the best way to let other people know about us and to help us increase our visibility so we can increase yours. Thank you so much and you can now return to the show and thank you for listening. In answer to your question, inherently people fear what they do not know. Mm -hmm. And over the last few decades, we have become familiar with gay and lesbian people through visibility. It's happened. And those that are seeking power can no longer use gay men or gay women as something to be afraid of because most of us have a gay sister or a gay brother or a gay aunt or a gay neighbor. And all of the fear and false opinion created around who these people were fell away as soon as people started to know directly someone who defines as gay. Yes. But what we don't have are a large swath of this country or this world who share the experience of actually knowing someone who is transgender or non-binary. So we're going down the same path. Those in power are saying these transgender people that you don't understand, you should fear them. And I'm Mm -hmm. the person who's going to protect you. So vote for me. Send me your money. Put your money in this basket. Whatever it is, it's all a bunch of lies. And parents all over this world are raising beautiful, wonderful transgender and non-binary kids. And many of them, and this is where our community needs to be honest, were part of the same group of people that didn't believe this experience mattered to them. Yeah. And, well, their own child came out and said, this is who I am. And for the lucky few, parents found acceptance through the love that they have for their children without having to understand what transgender and non-binary means. You do not need to understand something in order to accept it. Mm -hmm. And that's what we are seeing today. Thousands and thousands of families accepting their children for who they are. And for us, those are the stories that need to be amplified to show families like this is what it looks like when you say, okay, when you say, I love you, when you Mm -hmm. say, I trust you know who you are. When you say you can be whoever you are and actually mean it, right? Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, I hope that answered your question. It does. It Thank does. You. I mean, it, it's also making me think of <clears throat> generational things that I've noticed, you know, since I came back sort of into the fold, if you want to say that. Uh, you know, I think the thing that you, and I want to talk about that in a moment, the thing that you said about this guise of protecting, right? I mean, we can look back. Historically, you know, uh, white men are going to protect white women from black men, right? Um, in other countries, as a reason for us to go to war, you know, uh, we are going to protect brown brown women from uh, brown men, right? Who are these like brutal people? It just goes on and on. 
Uh, and so this idea, because I heard that with the Supreme Court as well, like we need to protect these women, we need to protect these fetuses, but they're not really talking about that at all. It is like you said, a power grab. It's how can we control people who are starting to become empowered or who have been empowered and it's it's been long enough, right? And to me, transgender and non-binary youth are the most vulnerable, right? Um, I do think that they stand stronger, not to go back to that trauma narrative when they have their families and communities and organizations like Gender Cool. Uh, I'm I'm curious about this generational thing. This kind of, kind of popped into my mind because I'm in the middle of all kinds of communities from some, you know, good friends who are 30, you know, and I'm in my mid 40s to the like young queer punk kids who are like in their 20s and then people my age and people in their 50s and so on. But um, there is something interesting that's happening right now with a a generational um, misunderstanding. Uh, I don't know if it's power. I don't know what it is, but of not wanting to accept uh, non-binary period. Right. And so I've been hearing this over and over again, the more people I speak with uh, who are typically my age or in their fifties saying, you know, there are only two genders uh, or they might even say sexes. I don't know. I think they're saying genders. There are only two genders, man, woman, male, female. And, you know, these kids are just kind of making me annoyed, right? Like they're just trying to make me, um, you know, unnerve me or something. And, and, and even hearing people sadly, cause I taught in the university system so long. So like I always had a non-hierarchical model. One of the first things I did was like give them my syllabus and say, okay, like what makes sense? What doesn't? I'm going to step out of the room. You can have control of the whiteboard. I want you to redo this syllabus for what's important to you. And I'm going to come back and we're going to negotiate and compromise. All of a sudden puts them in the, in the seat of, of their own power. Right. Um, but it is interesting to me that within our own community, sadly, there are some people who, uh, and I do believe there's a connection to people not believing, right. Trans, gender and tra well, trans and non-binary youth that they know who they are, that these categories are real and they even exist. Um, it's hard for me to talk to them because when I hear it, I'm always really shocked because sometimes there are people that have something in common with me and I relate to them. And then I realize like, wow, you really are like very close minded about this. And I'll just say it like bigoted, you know, it feels, uh, and also ageists in this other way where they don't want to, they're like, I'm the authority, you know, like you were saying, I work so hard to, for like, you know, um, same gender marriage rights and things like that. Like, why do we want to get rid of gender uh, for non-binary? I'll just call them youth. Um, and so I guess my question is, is how do we turn that conversation around? Because to me, some of these people, these are like, some of these people are quite powerful people and they could be our biggest allies, but I don't know what's going on there. I don't, I don't understand what's, what happened. Uh, I wonder if you have any thoughts on that. You know, it's, to me, it's egocentric, right? From the aspect of why does it matter to you how mm -hmm. someone else defines themselves to be? Like this, what impact does it have on your life that someone says, I feel neither male or female. I'm somewhere yes. in between. How is that about you? How is that about you as the listener? That has nothing to do with you whatsoever. It's just a person sharing an intimate detail about who they know themselves to be. And why is that a problem? Mm -hmm. I don't understand. Why is that a problem for you? And no one is asking you to be non-binary. No one is asking you to even understand the life experience of a non-binary person. Mm -hmm. People are simply talking about who they are. Sure. And you're going to then what? Judge them? Tell them that that's not true? That they can't possibly feel that way? It's like, it's like if you say, I'm hungry, and someone says, no, you're not. 
like so it's like a gas almost like a gaslighting or a right you can't you know so for you to say you know well how do i engage in a conversation with those people i think that's a really important question right um on both sides of you know an issue we've all become tired of sure. trying to engage people who are so rigid that they have no desire to grow. And there's not much we can do about that. Um, for gender cool and for me as a person, honestly, I don't spend time in those spaces. Mm -hmm. I spend time in the spaces where someone, instead of saying, no, there's only two genders, I spend time with the person who says, you know, I've been thinking about this a lot and I just don't get it. Yeah. Right now, there's a much better going, response. Right. That's where I'm going to spend my time working to help somebody come to an acceptance of a life experience that they will never have unless they are indeed non binary or transgender. You know, we speak in analogies. You can't know what this is like unless you live it. Yes. So if you're open to sharing and to listening and to learning, then I'm here for you. Right. But for those people who say, you know, this is the way that it is. Well, this is the way it is for you. Exactly. <laughs> and that's totally fine. Right. Like I, you know, it, it's only really a problem for me when that's impacting other people. Sure. Right. When they're taking that and pushing that against their own non-binary children. Right. Or their own non-binary neighbors where they're making life difficult for others. Um, yes. For for no reason whatsoever. There are so many things that need attention in this world. And I can promise you that someone's gender identity is not one of them. <laughs> I really like your answer because I think it goes back to, and I think we can talk about this a little more right now. It goes back to part of what gender cool is doing, right? And that mindset. And so this idea that we don't have to fight every battle, we're going to do what's best for these youth, right? Yeah, and I, I, I kind of use cool. the example of like, because someone asked me once, because I am out there, you know, like in the public. And so I have people saying weird things to me all the time. And, you know, every once in a while I do run across these um, transphobic comments. And sometimes I respond, sometimes I don't, I always respond, but I just sometimes don't, don't want to take it on. I'm exhausted. And to me, it's almost like arguing with someone who is drunk or something. It's like, they're, they're in this emotional state. They're all fired up and you, they're not even listening to you. They're just talking. They're just this mouthpiece talking. But, um, I think it goes really well into us talking. Maybe we can talk a little bit about trauma and, and the ways in which gender cool is attempting to turn that, uh, narrative around. Cause this is really important. I think for all people that do diversity, equity, inclusion, and social activist work to recognize this. People of, I think, our generation, and then also people who are younger that might just like, like take that up and start running with it. And it's like not producing the results they had hoped, right? And so we had also talked about that we're both, you know, Jewish and have that background. And there's also a trauma narrative there that kind of binds us, um, together, right? But it's also something that the LGBTQ uh, community has. And I think the trans community has, you know, we just had uh, a tra trans day of remembrance, which has always been something difficult for me to be able to talk about, because I didn't know how to engage it uh, until I saw, uh, I was actually kind of part of a mini vigil at the uh, National Trans Visibility day or visibility march. And then I sort of started to understand it more, the uh, the vulnerability, the sadness, the grief, but also the empowerment was there too. And that I understood that uh, better from my experience. But I, I'm curious about, um, you know, it's tough to break these narratives. You know, these narratives are strong and they're multi-generational. Uh, and I, I'm really curious about you know, um, why is it important to get away from these trauma only narratives? And I'm thinking specifically for transgender and non-binary youth. Uh, and I know you've already talked about it a little, like they don't even, 
need that, right? We don't need to put that on them. But um, why is it important to replace it with something else? And, and what do you feel like you're replacing it with? I don't know if we're replacing it as much as we're balancing it. Okay. Right? Like um, everyone has tough stuff in their lives, sure. regardless of their gender identity or sexual orientation. And when we highlight those things, which are really pretty small parts of most of our lives, right? Like who you're attracted to is a very small part of who you are. Your gender identity is a very small part of who you are, right? You you don't go around all day saying, hi, everyone, I'm female, right? <laughs> it just, you don't, it's just part of your life. And sure. so in the same way, um, there's trauma mm -hmm. about, involved around your orientation or your identity, um, but there's also beauty, mm -hmm. right? And um, what we saw was a really huge imbalance of mostly trauma forward shared experiences from within our own LGBTQ plus community. And there are glimmers like during pride month, right? Of mm -hmm. showing positivity. Um, but who is telling the story of, you know, the wonderful married gay couple who's raising children, right? And who's telling those stories of, you know, the, the lesbian couple, the interracial lesbian couple that's raising amazing kids as well, um, or choosing to adopt or whatever, right? We are, we're, we're really lazy <laughs> as a community um, of highlighting the triumphs. Um, mm -hmm. We're getting better. I think that the balance is there, you know, 40 under 40, 20 under 20, movers and shakers in the business world, like we're getting, mm -hmm. we're really trying as a community to highlight our successes. And I think that for me is just a more youthful, more positive, more inspirational, more effective way for every person to live their life regardless of where you are on a spectrum, right? Like if you are cis hat, like don't go around talking about how bad the weather is all the time. Right? <laughs> Talk about how grateful you are for just being here in the weather, sure. right? So it's just a perspective aspect. Mm. And it is not to discount trauma in any way. Again, as I said at the beginning, without the collective trauma, of those who came before us, we could not be sitting in this positive space we are today. So it is incredibly important. And for those that are working in that space that have dedicated their lives to suicide hotline, to working to better uh, trans and non-binary kids who are deeply traumatized and working in these spaces of, um, you know, harassment and, um, you know, criminal abuse, that is very real. And there is absolutely nothing that gender cool is doing or saying to try to say that that stuff does not exist. It absolutely does. Yes. But part of this, part of this moving forward is, is, is a balance, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's trying to find where are the ultimate issues? Well, I think you are cool, Gara. Gender yeah. cool. <laughs> I hope you think I am too. Uh, I would love to. I'd love to hear and have our uh, listeners hear about how they can get involved with Gender Cool. How could they can stay in touch with you and the things that you're doing and your organization and the champions and all of the the youth that are involved. Can you give any uh, information, instructions, and how we can support your organization or just day-to-day -day life to help uh, your engage in your projects? Absolutely. Um, thank you. Uh, please visit gendercool.org. That is the one stop for everything gendercool. You'll find all of our information there and all of the different programs that uh, we're currently working on right now. We are very deeply involved in uh youth sports and how uh, the legislation is, is moving in that space. So if you'd like to support us there, that would be great. And then um, as you just asked, uh, Dr. Lerner, in real life, I would ask that if you hear anything negative 
about transgender or non-binary people. If you've listened to this program now for this hour, you know me, right? I'm a transgender person. And so you can stand in that experience and you can say, you know, those opinions that you're saying, that negative stuff, that's not my experience. I know a transgender person and those things that you're saying are simply not what I experience. And you're not forming a debate you're not doing anything except sharing your experience. And what I know and what I've learned in my own life is that experience beats opinion every single time. That's it. Yes. No, it's beautiful. I, uh, and that's wonderful, wonderful advice. Uh, I want to thank you, Gara Goldstein, founder of Gender Cool. This has been a beautiful conversation and I love to be surprised and educated and inspired. And I think that you delivered all of those things today. So, and I think that our listeners are going to feel the same. So I want to just really thank you, you know, from deep down inside, I think you filled in a lot of, a lot of things that people just didn't even consider uh, about, about your organization and, and, and those whom you serve. Thank so you. Yeah, I well, just really happy to join you again anytime. No, so. I love. I was just going to say I would love for this to be the first of, you know, many conversations that we have, and and hopefully we can continue to find a way to collaborate in some way. Uh, mm -hmm. I would really really love that. Uh, and so I just want to close off saying uh, my name is Dr. Shannon Wong Lerner. You're here with the intersection diverse folks converse. And I do want to mention, because I always forget, because I get so excited and inspired by the shows that we do have a YouTube page. We have an anchor page. Please, please, please subscribe to these things. Anchor actually will bridge off into all your favorite podcast platforms like Spotify, like Apple, and like all types of different platforms, all of them. I don't, I can't think of all of them right now, but, but it's, it's, it really is all of them when you go to our anchor page. And so, you know, you can click on those icons and go to the one that you like and, uh, and then you can, you can subscribe there so that you know, when we're publishing these, uh, and then also on YouTube to subscribe, we also have a GoFundMe page. If you want to help with production costs, the intersection is a not-for-profit project. Uh, neither I or, you know, Gara or any of the other guests or me as the host are paid. Everything goes to production costs. And so you've been here with the Intersection Diverse Folks Converse Season 2, Episode 4, here with Gara Goldstein, founder of Gender Cool. The podcast episode title was Be You and Unapologetically Out Loud. Gender Cool helps transgender and non-binary youth tell their own stories. Thank you again, and we'll see you next time. You've just finished an episode of The Intersection, Diverse Folks Converse. We would like to let you know that there are three different ways you can support The Intersection, which is made by and for queer people of color and gender non-conforming people in a way that is not for profit, meaning we have complete creative control over all of our content. And the way that we do that is by getting support from all of you. So the three ways you can help us is consider donating what you can. And we really do have this in a Bernie Sanders style. So like even a dollar, $3, $5, every time you hear the intersection, which is basically the cost of a cup of coffee, will help us keep our doors open and help us stay true to the messages and the content and the themes that you want to hear. We have a GoFundMe page and that link is on YouTube in the video description. We'll also put it on Anchor or whatever podcast platform you're looking at. You can also subscribe and leave reviews for The Intersection on your podcast platform or Dr. Shannon Wong Lerner's YouTube channel, which houses the intersection. The more you do this, the more visible we will be and the more we can be out there to reach more people in need of this programming. You might also consider volunteering your services or your time. 
So if you have a special skill that you think could help the intersection, please contact Dr. Shannon and let me know. My contact information is also in the YouTube description or on Anchor. Thank you so much for joining us, and we hope you will join us again. Again, this is Dr. Shannon Wong Lerner, host of The Intersection Diverse Folks Converse, programming made by and for queer people of color and gender non-conforming people. Have a great day, and thank you again.